Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here at RIA with what looks like a totally standard and really gorgeously nice model of 1911 Colt pistol. However, it's not. This is a model of 1910 Colt pistol, and it is about 90% scale of a traditional standard 1911 that we're all used to, because this is chambered for 38 ACP. Now, you are probably familiar with the 1911 in 38 Auto or 38 Super, and you're thinking to yourself, it's the same frame size as a standard 1911, what are you talking about? Well, you're right, the standard ones are, this isn't. So let me take you back to 1910. Colt has been making progress in developing a military pistol for the United States. Uh, they went through the 1907 pistol trials, and then a subsequent series of trials. They had the 1909 pattern, and then they finally introduced the 1910, which had pretty much all of the features that we now recognize as standard on the 1911. Uh, the reaction was really good. The Army pretty much finally came to the decision of, OK, we're going to adopt that. It took a little bit longer, and when they did adopt it, it was 1911, hence it was, term it was designated the Model 1911. And that's the pistol that we're familiar with. Well, in 1910, as the Army is looking very favorably on this final iterated design, Colt starts looking at, OK, you know, we've spent a lot of money and many years putting this design together, now let's try and capitalize on it. And so they figure, in addition to 45 ACP, they'd also like to sell them to other markets, places that are outside the US where there isn't this military connection to a 45 caliber cartridge. The Europeans all seem to like 38s and 9mm, so Let's try one of those. So they design a 9.8 millimeter cartridge, uh, based kind of largely based on their 38 ACP, but rimless. So it's a little more modern, like the 45 Auto. And uh, they tell the tool room uh, at Colt, you know, let's let's make up a couple samples of these and present them to management and see, you know, maybe we can do this for export sales or as a slightly different version we can offer people. And it's important to remember at this point that there is no production line tooling for the 1911, because that hasn't been built yet. All of the 1910-1911 trials pistols are being made basically by hand. Uh, and so the tool room, when they're asked to put together a, cartridge, a pistol for this 9.8mm cartridge, they don't take the standard frame, because there isn't necessarily a standard frame really. There's the 45 caliber frame, but if we're making a 38, let's make a 38 sized frame. And so this is just slightly scaled down. Instead of a 5 inch barrel, this has a 4.68 inch barrel, and pretty much all the other dimensions are equally squished. So they make a couple of them, they present them to management, and it kind of goes to the back burner. Um, they want to focus on finalizing the army contract and get that one actually in the bag before they start other projects. Right about this same time though, they're also getting, so they're, they're having some trouble with FN. FN and Colt both have the rights to uh, manufacture and sell pistols based on John Browning's patents. And they're pretty much segregated geographically. Colt has exclusive rights to North America, FN has exclusive rights to basically Western Europe. Uh, but there are a bunch of places where they can both legally sell, and they have an, ag an agreement between the two companies as to how they'll behave regarding each other. But FN's pistols are starting to show up more and more in Central and South America. And Colt hadn't really been focusing much on those markets, but they start getting a bit worried when they start seeing uh, pistols that they could theoretically be producing uh, showing up in South America from FN. So it would be really expensive and obnoxious to try and deal with this in court. So Colt really just wants to arrange, negotiate a new uh, mutual you know, sales agreement with FN. And they want a little bit of leverage before they enter into those negotiations, because right now FN's in the stronger position because they're selling stuff all over the place. So there are some pistol trials that are coming up in Europe. The British are going to have one, and then the Romanians are going to have one as well. And so Colt gets one of their pistol experts, and they get Eugene Rising, who's working for Colt at the time, and they set them up with one of these guys in 9.8mm, and I think also a 45, and send them off to Europe. Uh, to show off the pistol. And it does pretty well in London, in the British trials, and they take it down to Romania, and it's, it's, they get positive reactions to it there. And this is enough to get FN a little bit worried, because the Balkans, or the, the Balkan countries, like Romania, Bulgaria, 
um, are a potential market for both companies that aren't exclusively covered, exclusively provided to either one. And FN would certainly like to have those. FN is working on developing its own version of the 1911, uh, which, by the way, I have a separate video on. So I'll link that at the end of this, and it's a really interesting counterpart what FN was doing at this time. Um, but having this pistol show up in Romania and do pretty well kind of puts FN on notice that, by the way, Colt's not just ignoring all of this stuff. And so while it wasn't actually adopted by Romania, or the British, um, there is some question as to how serious Colt was really taking these trials. It's unclear to me if they actually legitimately wanted to get a Romanian contract, or if this was primarily a way to, to get in a marketing a negotiating position with FN. Not sure about that. But at any rate, if it was the latter, it succeeded, because they ended up negotiating a new mutual sales agreement, which would run until well, in 1949, FN was kind of put out of business by the Germans, so it became a moot point at that point. And by the way, World War I pretty much ended FN's uh, interest in developing a 1911 equivalent. Because after the war there were just too many American 45s floating around, FN didn't have a lot of spare capital to put into new production of new guns, and that project was not high enough on the priority list and got scrapped. Now, back at... well. Before we go back to Colt and talk about what happened after the war, let's take a closer look at this particular example, so I can actually show you that it is in fact not a standard 1911. This is a gorgeous pistol, as you can see. Uh, I think the vast majority of people, if handed one of these pistols just by itself, wouldn't they might know they might think something was a little odd, but they wouldn't be able to tell that this was actually smaller than a standard 1911. But it becomes pretty obvious when you compare them side to side. You can see the difference in barrel length up here. Uh, it's only a, about a third of an inch difference, like 0.32 inches, um, which would be something like 8 millimeters, 7 or 8 millimeters difference. Um, but it's enough that literally none of the parts are interchangeable with a standard 1911. You can see the difference in the magazines as well. Note that the 1910 uh, magazine here is just slightly shorter. It is also just a tiny bit narrower than a standard 1911 magazine. And it's worth pointing out that the 1911s that Colt would eventually actually put on the market in 38 Super uh, were the exact same frame and the same magazine size as the standard 45 caliber guns. Now I've been talking about this in the context of a 9.8 millimeter pistol for European military trials, but this magazine is marked Mill Colt 38 Cal. And the slide, as the sharp-eyed among you will have already noticed, is marked Colt Automatic Caliber 38. So what's the deal? Is this not actually a 9.8 millimeter? And the answer is no, this actually is not 9.8 millimeter. This is 38. The idea of using this to replace all of the obsolete 1900 and 1902 pattern pistols would certainly have been an enticing one. These have a lot more modern features, they have much better safeties, uh, they have a much more, uh, frankly, a safer, stronger, and more reliable action with the single pin uh, tilting barrel instead of the old two pin uh, you know, parallel barrel pivot deal of the 1900 and the 1902. So that's what they were thinking with this, uh, this design. You can really see the size difference of the magazine kind of illustrated. If I put the 1910 magazine into the 1911 pistol, It'll fit front to back, but there's just a little bit of space in that magazine well. And of course I can't fit the 1911 magazine into the 1910 pistol at all. In the hand, this thing is really comfortable. Um, it's actually it's kind of nicer than a 1911. Now I am a little bit concerned about hammer bite. Uh, I know a lot of people, including myself, get hammer bite from a standard 1911 spur hammer, and this being slightly smaller I suspect would uh, would bite a little bit worse. You got a little more, uh, the hammer's a little closer to your hand to start with. So that might be an issue, but boy, beyond that, it's a, it's a really interesting concept uh, and a really good handling pistol that they put together. Now this pistol would come back to the attention of Colt's management in 1913. Uh, there was a meeting where they were trying to decide, like, okay, what are we going to actually put into production? And they were looking at these, and they were also looking at what would be the Colt Woodsman, a 22 caliber pistol. 
And at that time, they decided, we'll go ahead and set up production tooling for the Woodsman, but they're going to hold off on this. And that was kind of like the end of it. They never would put these into production, which is why I think there are a grand total of five that exist. Four that are serial numbered, one that is unnumbered at the Springfield Armory National Historic Site. Uh, however, that doesn't explain, that's not the full story for this particular pistol. You can see it's in gorgeous condition. And the reason is, in 1929, Colt was going through the process of introducing the 1911A1 in 38 Super onto the market. And someone remembered these things, and they're like, weren't we experimenting with like a 38 rimless cartridge back, you know, 20 years ago? Yeah. I think we were. And they, they have this one still around. Um, they might have had a couple others at that point. It's a little unclear exactly what happened to all of them. We know number two was checked out to one of their salesmen in 1922 and never returned. Uh, this one was logged out to Colt's Museum in 1929. They went ahead and finished it up real nice, made it look nice and pretty, uh, like a brand new pistol, specifically to give to Colt's Museum. Um, kind of as a commemorative thing in concert with this introduction of the pistols in 38 Super. So that's where this particular one came from. It eventually obviously found its way out of Colt's uh, factory museum and onto the private market uh, where it exists today. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. This is a really cool, I think it's a really interesting story about what could have been, because this is a really comfortable little pistol. And if you think about the prevalence of 1911 pattern guns in, say, 9mm Parabellum today, this would have been a perfect frame to do that with. Uh, a little bit more compact of a pistol than starting with a 45 caliber frame. At any rate, it's, uh, it's all a big moot hypothetical, because they never did put these into production, and I don't expect anybody is going to now. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.